सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास सेवेंथ इन टाइटल्ड आर पास टू दिस इज द चैप्टर नंबर फोर टाइटल द मुगल एम्पायर फ्रॉम पेज नंबर फोर्टी फाइव टू पेज नंबर फिफ्टी नाइन Let's listen to the chapter The Mughal Empire page number 45 The Mughal Empire ruling as large a territory as the Indian subcontinent with such a diversity of people and cultures was an extremely difficult task for any ruler to accomplish in the middle ages quite in contrast to their predecessors the mughals created an empire and accomplished what had hitherto seemed possible for only short periods of time from the latter half of the 16th century they expanded their kingdom from agra and delhi until in the 17th century they controlled nearly all of the subcontinent they imposed structures of administration and ideas of governance that outlasted their rule leaving a political legacy that succeeding rulers of the subcontinent could not ignore today the prime minister of india addresses the nation on independence day from the ramparts of the red fort in delhi the residence of the mughal emperors on the bottom of this page a picture is shown figure 1 the red fort page 46 who were the mughals the mughals were descendant of two great lineages of rulers from their mother's side they were the descendants of genghis khan who died in 1227 the mongol ruler who ruled over parts of china and central asia from their father's side they were the successors of taimur who died in 1404 the ruler of iran iraq and modern day turkey however the mughals did not like to be called mughal or mongol this was because chungiz khan's memory was associated with the massacre of innumerable people it was also linked with the uzbegs their mongol competitors on the other hand The Mughals were proud of their Taimurid ancestry not least of all because their great ancestor had captured Delhi in 1398 They celebrated their genealogy pictorially each ruler getting a picture made of Taimur and himself Take a look at figure 2 which is somewhat like a group photograph Figure 2 a miniature painting dated 1702 to 1712 of taimur his descendants and the mughal emperors taimur is in the center and on his right is his son miran shah the first mughal emperor babur's great great grandfather and then abu said babur's grandfather to the left of taimur are sultan mohammad mirza babur's great grandfather and umar sheikh babur's father the mughal emperors babur akbar and shah jahan are the third fourth and fifth individuals on taimur's right and on his left in the same order are humayun jahangir and aurangzeb on the left hand side of this page a question is being asked written in a blue box Do you think this painting suggests that the Mughals claimed kingship as a birthright? Page forty-seven. Mughal military campaigns. On the right-hand side of this page, a picture is shown. Figure three: Mughal army on campaign. Babur, the first Mughal emperor. Who ruled between 1526 to 1530 succeeded to the throne of Fargana in 1494 when he was only 12 years old 
he was forced to leave his ancestral throne due to the invasion of another Mongol group, the Uzbeks. After years of wandering, he seized Kabul in 1504. In 1526, he defeated the Sultan of Delhi, Ibrahim Lodi, at Panipat and captured Delhi and Agra. Table 1 charts some of the major campaigns of the Mughals. Study it carefully and see if you can notice any long-term patterns. You will notice, for example, that the Afghans were an immediate threat to Mughal authority. Note the relationship between the Mughals and the Ahoms. See also Chapter 7, the Six. See also Chapter 8 and 10 and Mewar and Marwar. See also Chapter 9. How was Humayun's relationship with Safavid Iran different from Akbar's? Did the annexation of Golconda and Bijapur in Aurangzeb's reign end hostilities in the Deccan? On the left bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 4. Cannons were an important addition in 16th century warfare. Babur used them effectively in the first battle of Panipat. On the right-hand bottom of this page, some important information is shared regarding gunpowder. Gunpowder technology was brought to India for the warfare in the 14th century. Firearms were used for the first time in regions such as Gujarat, Malwa and Deccan and was used by Babur in early 16th century. Page 48 Table 1 Mughal Emperors Major Campaigns and Events Babur 1526-1530 to 1530. 1526 defeated Ibrahim Lodi and his Afghan supporters at Panipat. 1527 defeated Rana Sangha, Rajput rulers and allies at Khanuva. 1528 defeated the Rajputs at Chanderi. 1528 defeated the Rajputs at Chanderi established control over Agra and Delhi before his death. Humayun 1530-1540 1555-1556 1. Humayun divided his inheritance according to the will of his father. His brothers were each given a province. The ambitions of his brother Mirza Kamran weakened Humayun's cause against Afghan competitors. Shir Khan defeated Humayun at Chausa in 1539 and Kannauj in 1540, forcing him to flee to Iran. 2. In Iran, Humayun received help from the Safavid Shah. He recaptured Delhi in 1555 but died the next year after an accident in this building. The picture of the building is shown in the middle of this page on the right-hand side. Akbar, 1556-1605 Akbar was 13 years old when he became emperor. His reign can be divided into three periods. 1. 1556-1570 Akbar became independent of the regent Bairam Khan and other members of his domestic staff. Military campaigns were launched against the Suris and other Afghans, against the neighbouring kingdoms of Malwa and Gondwana and to suppress the revolt of his half-brother Mirza Hakim and the Uzbeks. In 1568, the Sisodia capital of Chittor was seized and in 1569, Ranthambhor. 2. 1570 to 1585. Military campaigns in Gujarat were followed by campaigns in the east in Bihar, Bengal, and Odisha. These campaigns were complicated by the 1579 1580 revolt in support of Mirza Hakim. 
1503, 1585 to 1605, expansion of Akbar's empire, campaigns were launched in the northwest, Kandhar was seized from the Safavids, Kashmir was annexed, as also Kabul, after the death of Mirza Hakim. Campaigns in the Deccan started and Berar, Khandesh and parts of Ahmednagar were annexed. In the last years of his reign, Akbar was distracted by the rebellion of Prince Salim, the future emperor Jahangir. Page 49 Jahangir 1605-1627 Military campaigns started by Akbar continued. The Sisodia ruler of Mewar, Amar Singh, accepted Mughal service. Less successful campaigns against the Sikhs, the Ahoms and Ahmadnagar followed. Prince Khurram, the future Emperor Shah Jahan, rebelled in the last years of his reign. The efforts of Noor Jahan, Jahangir's wife, to marginalize him were unsuccessful. Shah Jahan 1627-1658 Mughal campaigns continued in the Deccan under Shah Jahan. The Afghan noble Khan Jahan Lodi rebelled and was defeated. Campaigns were launched against Ahmadnagar. The Bundelas were defeated and Orcha seized. In the northwest, the campaign to seize Bulk from the Uzbeks was unsuccessful and Kandhar was lost to the Safavids. In 1632, Ahmadnagar was finally annexed and the Bijapur forces sued for peace. In 1657 to 1658, there was conflict over succession amongst Shah Jahan's sons. Aurangzeb was victorious and his three brothers, including Dara Shikoho, were killed. Shah Jahan was imprisoned for the rest of his life in Agra. Aurangzeb 1658-1707 1. In the northeast, the Ahoms were defeated in 1663 but rebelled again in 1680s. Campaigns in the northwest against the Yusufzai and the Sikhs were temporarily successful. Mughal intervention in the succession and internal politics of Rathor Rajputs of Marwar led to their rebellion. Campaigns against the Maratha chieftain Shivaji were initially successful, but Aurangzeb insulted Shivaji, who escaped from Agra, declared himself an independent king and resumed his campaigns against the Mughals. Prince Akbar rebelled against Aurangzeb and received support from the Marathas and the Deccan Sultanate. He finally fled to Safavid, Iran. 2. After Akbar's rebellion, Aurangzeb sent armies against the Deccan Sultanates. Bijapur was annexed in 1685 and Golconda in 1687. From 1698, Aurangzeb personally managed campaigns in the Deccan against the Marathas who started guerrilla warfare. Aurangzeb also had to face the rebellion in North India of the Sikhs, Jats and Satnamis in the northeast of the Ahoms and in the Deccan of the Marathas. His death was followed by a succession conflict amongst his sons. Page 50 On the top of this page, a map is shown. Map 1 Military campaigns under Akbar and Aurangzeb Kashmir, 1586 Chittor, 1568 Gujarat, 1572 Ranthambhor, 1569 Malwa, 1561 Patna, 1574 Bengal, 1571 Bijapur, 1685 Golconda, 1687 Mughal Traditions and Succession The Mughals did not believe in the rule of primogeniture, where the eldest son inherited his father's estate. Instead, 
they followed the Mughal and Taimurid custom of coopercenary inheritance or a division of the inheritance amongst all the sons. Follow the highlighted passages in Table 1 and note the evidence for rebellions by Mughal princes. Which do you think is a fairer division of inheritance, primogeniture or coopercenary? Mughal relations with other rulers. Take a note at Table 1 once again. You will notice that the Mughal rulers campaigned constantly against the rulers who refused to accept their authority. But as the Mughals became powerful, many other rulers also joined them voluntarily. The Rajputs are a good example of this. Many of them married their daughters into Mughal families and received high positions. But many resisted as well. On the bottom left of this page, some important information is shared in a pink box. Mughal marriages with Rajputs. The mother of Jahangir was a Kachwa princess, daughter of the Rajput ruler of Ambar, modern-day Jaipur. The mother of Shah Jahan was a Rathor princess, daughter of Rajput ruler of Marwad, Jodhpur. Page 51. The Sisodia Rajputs of Mewad refused to accept Mughal authority for a long time. Once defeated, however, they were honorably treated by the Mughals. Given their lands, Watan, back as assignments, Watan Jagir. The careful balance between defeating but not humiliating their opponents enabled the Mughals to extend their influence over many kings and chieftains. But it was difficult to keep this balance all the time. Look at Table 1 again. Note that Aurangzeb insulted Shivaji when he came to accept Mughal authority. What was the consequence of this insult? Mansabdars and Jagirdars. As the empire expanded to encompass different regions, the Mughals recruited diverse bodies of people. From a small nucleus of Turkish nobles or Turanis, they expanded to include Iranians, Indian Muslims, Afghans, Rajputs, Marathas and other groups. Those who joined Mughal service were enrolled as Mansabdars. The term Mansabdar refers to an individual who holds a Mansab, meaning a position or rank. It was a grading system used by the Mughals to fix 1. Rank 2 salary and three military responsibilities. Rank and salary were determined by a numerical value called Zat. The higher the Zat, the more prestigious was the noble's position in court and the larger his salary. The Mansabdar's military responsibilities required him to maintain a specified number of Savar or cavalrymen. The Mansabdar brought his cavalry men for review, got them registered, their horses branded and then received money to pay them as salary. Mansabdars received their salaries as revenue assignments called Jagirs, which were somewhat like Iktas. But unlike Muktis, most Mansabdars did not actually reside in or administer their Jagirs. They only had rights to the revenue of their assignments, which was collected for them by their servants, while the Mansabdars themselves served in some other part of the country. On the right-hand bottom of this page, an important information is shared, written in a pink box. Zat Ranking Nobles with a Zat of 5,000 were ranked higher than those of 1,000. In Akbar's reign, there were 29 Mansabdars with a rank of 5,000 Zat. By Aurangzeb's reign, the number of Mansabdars had increased to 79. Would this have meant more expenditure for the state? Page 52 
On the top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 5. A Mansabdar on march with his Savars. In Akbar's reign, these Jagirs were carefully assessed so that their revenues were roughly equal to the salary of the Mansabdar. By Aurangzeb's reign, this was no longer the case and the actual revenue collected was often less than the granted sum. There was also a huge increase in the number of Mansabdars, which meant a long wait before they received a Jagir. These and other factors created a shortage in the number of Jagirs. As a result, many Jagirdars tried to extract as much revenue as possible while they had a Jagir. Aurangzeb was unable to control these developments in the last years of his reign and the peasantry therefore suffered tremendously. Zapt and Zamindars The main source of income available to Mughal rulers was tax on the produce of the peasantry. In most places, peasants paid taxes through the rural elites, that is, the headman or the local chieftain. The Mughals used one term, Zamindars, to describe all intermediaries, whether they were local headmen of villages or powerful chieftains. Akbar's revenue minister, Todermal, carried out a careful survey of crop yields, prices and areas cultivated for a 10-year period, 1570 to 1580. On the basis of this data, tax was fixed on each crop in cash. Each province was divided into revenue circles with its own schedule of revenue rates for individual crops. This revenue system was known as ZAP. It was prevalent in those areas where Mughal administrators could survey the land and keep very careful accounts. This was not possible in provinces such as Gujarat and Bengal. On the left-hand bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 6 Details from a miniature from Shah Jahan's reign depicting corruption in his father's administration. 1. A corrupt officer receiving a bribe and 2. A tax collector punishing poor peasants. Page 53 in some areas, the Zamidars exercised a great deal of power. The exploitation by Mughal administrators could drive them to rebellion. Sometimes, Zamindars and peasants of the same caste allied in rebelling against the Mughal authority. These peasant revolts challenged the stability of Mughal Empire from the end of the 17th century. Akbar Nama and Aine Akbari Akbar ordered one of his close friends and courtiers, Abul Fazl, to write a history of his reign. Abul Fazl wrote a three-volume history of Akbar's reign, titled Akbar Nama. The first volume dealt with Akbar's ancestors and the second volume recorded the events of Akbar's reign. The third volume is the Aine Akbari. It deals with Akbar's administration, household, army, the revenues and the geography of his empire. It also provides rich details about the traditions and culture of the people living in India. The most interesting aspect of the Aine Akbari is its rich statistical details about things as diverse as crops, yields, prices, wages and revenues. In the middle of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 7 Akbar receiving the Akbar Nama from Abul Fazl. A closer look, Akbar's policies. The broad features of administration were laid down by Akbar and were elaborately discussed by Abul Fazl in his book, The Akbar Nama, in particular in its last volume, the Aine Akbari. Abul Fazl explained that the empire was divided into provinces called Subas, governed by a Subedar. 
who carried out both political and military functions. Each province also had a financial officer or divan. For the maintenance of peace and order in his province, the Subedar was supported by other officers, such as the military paymaster, Bakshi, the minister in charge of religious and charitable patronage, Sadar, military commanders, Fajdars, and the town police commander, Kotwal. Page 54 Noor Jahan's Influence in Jahangir's Court Mehrun Nisa married the Emperor Jahangir in 1611 and received the title Noor Jahan. She remained extremely loyal and supportive to the monarch. As a mark of honour, Jahangir struck silver coins bearing his own titles on one side and on the other the inscription struck in the name of the Queen, Begum Noor Jahan. The adjoining document is an order or farman of Noor Jahan. The square seal states, Command of Her Most Sublime and Elevated Majesty Noor Jahan, Pad Shah Begum. The round seal states, By the son of Shah Jahangir, she became as brilliant as the moon. May Noor Jahan Pad Shah be the lady of the age. Figure 8 Noor Jahan's Farman Akbar's nobles commanded large armies and had access to large amounts of revenue. While they were loyal, the empire functioned efficiently, but by the end of the 17th century, many nobles had built independent networks of their own. Their loyalties to the empire were weakened by their own self-interest. While Akbar was at Fatehpur Sikri during the 1570s, he started discussions on religion with the ulema, Brahmans, Jewish priests who were Roman Catholics and Zoroastrians. These discussions took place in the Ibadat Khana. He was interested in the religion and social customs of different people. Akbar's interaction with people of different faiths made him realize that religious scholars who emphasized ritual and dogma were often bigots. Their teachings created divisions and disharmony amongst his subjects. On the left-hand side of this page, some important information is shared. Dogma A statement or an interpretation declared as authoritative with the expectation that it would be followed without question. Bigot An individual who is intolerant of another person's religious beliefs or culture. Page 55 On the top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 9 Akbar holding discussions with learned individuals of different faiths in the Ibadat Khana. This eventually led Akbar to the idea of sulah -e kul or universal peace. This idea of tolerance did not discriminate between the people of different religions in his realm. Instead, it focused on a system of ethics, honesty, justice, peace that was universally applicable. Abul Fazl helped Akbar in framing a vision of governance around this idea of sulah -e kul This principle of governance was followed by Jahangir and Shah Jahan as well. Can you identify the Jewish priests in this picture? sulah -e kul Jahangir, Akbar's son, described his father's policy of sulah -e kul in the following words, As in the wide expanse of the divine compassion, there is room for all classes and the followers of all creeds. So, in his imperial dominions, which on all sides were limited only by the sea, there was room for the professors of opposite religions, and for beliefs, good and bad, 
and the road to intolerance was closed. Sunnis and Shias met in one mosque and Christians and Jews in one church to pray. He consistently followed the principle of universal peace, sulah e kul Akbar commissioned the translation of many Sanskrit works into Persian. A maktab khana or translation bureau was also established at Fatehpur Sikri for this purpose. The Mahabharat, Ramayana, Leelavati and Yogvashisht were some of the notable Sanskrit works that were taken up for translation. The Razmanama, Persian translation of the Mahabharat, contains lavish illustrations of the events of Mahabharat. The Mughal Empire in the 17th century and after. The administrative and military efficiency of the Mughal Empire led to great economic and commercial prosperity. International travellers described it as the fabled land of wealth. But these same visitors were also appalled at the state of poverty that existed side by side with the greatest opulence. The inequalities were glaring. Documents from the 20th century of Shah Jahan's reign inform us that the highest ranking mansabdars were only 445 in number out of a total of 8,000. This small number, a mere 5.6% of the total number of mansabdars, received 61.5% of the total estimated revenue of the empire as salaries for themselves and their troopers. The Mughal emperors and their mansabdars spent a great deal of their income on salaries and goods. This expenditure benefited the artisans and peasantry who supplied them with goods and produce. But the scale of revenue collection left very little for investment in the hands of the primary producers, the peasant and the artisan. The poorest amongst them lived from hand to mouth and they could hardly consider investing in additional resources, tools and supplies to increase their productivity. The wealthier peasantry and artisanal groups the merchants and bankers profited in this economic world. The enormous wealth and resources commanded by the Mughal elite made them an extremely powerful group of people in the late 17th century. As the authority of the Mughal emperor slowly declined, his servants emerged as powerful centers of power in the regions. They constituted new dynasties and held command of provinces like Hyderabad and Awadh. Although they continued to recognize the Mughal emperor in Delhi as their master, by the 18th century the provinces of the empire had consolidated their independent political identities. We will read more about them in Chapter 10, page 57. Kings and Queens There were several great monarchs, all near contemporaries, in different parts of the world in the 16th century. These included the ruler of Ottoman Turkey, Sultan Suleiman, 1520-1566. During his rule, the Ottoman state expanded into Europe, seizing Hungary and besieging Austria. His armies also seized Baghdad and Iraq. Much of North Africa all the way into Morocco acknowledged Ottomans' authority. Suleiman also reconstructed the Ottoman navy. Its domination over the eastern Mediterranean brought the navy into competition with Spain. In the Arabian Sea, it challenged the Portuguese. The monarch was given the title of al Qanuni or the lawgiver because of the large number of regulations or Qanun passed during his reign. These were aimed to standardize administrative procedures throughout the expanding domains of the empire and specifically to protect the peasantry 
from forced labour and extraordinary taxes. Later, in the 17th century, when public order declined in the Ottoman domains, the reign of Suleiman Khanuni was remembered as a period of ideal governance. Find out more about Akbar's other contemporaries, the ruler of England, Queen Elizabeth, 1558-1603, the Safavid ruler of Iran, Shah Abbas, 1588-1629, and the more controversial Russian ruler, Tsar Ivan V Vasilevich, also called Ivan the Terrible, 1530 to 1584. Imagine, you have inherited a kingdom. Remember, Babur and Akbar were about your age when they became rulers. How would you make your kingdom stable and prosperous? Let's recall. 1. Match the following. Mansab, Mongol, Sisodia Rajput, Rathor Rajput, Noor Jahan, Subedar, Marwad, Governor, Uzbek, Mewad, Rank, Jahangir. Page 58. 2. Fill in the blanks. A. The capital of Mirza Hakim, Akbar's half brother, was fill in the blank. B. The five Deccan Sultanates were Berard, Khandesh, Ahmadnagar, fill in the blank and fill in the blank. C. If Zat determined a Mansabdar's rank and salary, Savar indicated his fill in the blank. D. Abul Fazl, Akbar's friend and counsellor, helped him frame the idea of fill in the blank so that he could govern a society composed of many religions, cultures and castes. 3. What were the central provinces under the control of the Mughals? 4. What was the relationship between the Mansabdar and the Jagir? Let's understand. 5. What was the role of the Zamidar in Mughal administration? 6. How were the debates with religious scholars important in the formation of Akbar's ideas on governance? 7. Why did the Mughals emphasize their Taimurid and not their Mongol descent? Keywords Mughal, Mansab, Jagir. Zat, Savar, Sulahe Kul, Primogeniture, Copersonary, Zap, Zamidar. Page 59. Let's discuss. 8. How important was the income from land revenue to the stability of the Mughal Empire? 9. Why was it important for the Mughals to recruit Mansabdars from diverse backgrounds and not just Turanis and Iranis? 10. Like the Mughal Empire, India today is also made up of many social and cultural units. Does this pose a challenge to national integration? 11. Peasants were vital for the economy of the Mughal Empire. Do you think that they are as important today? Has the gap in the income between the rich and the poor in India changed a great deal from the period of the Mughals? Let's do. 12. The Mughal Empire left its impact on the different regions of the subcontinent in a variety of ways. Find out if it had any impact in the city, village or region in which you live. The chapter 4 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator, Babla Kuchar. You were just listening to this audiobook. 
टेक्निकल कंट्रोल बटी लैंगलिंगडो टेक्निकल असिस्टेंस विकास सांगवान असिस्टेंस इन प्रोडक्शन कुसुम लता डायरेक्शन एंड प्रोडक्शन विमलेश चौधरी दिस ऑडियो बुक इज ब्रॉट टू यू बाय सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी न्यू डेली इंडिया